Hello, today I'm carrying on with my series called Devoted Revisited. In this series, I'm really looking at what I believe we can learn from the very first church and a particular passage in Acts chapter 2. At the beginning of this series, I looked particularly at the point that the members of the very first church devoted themselves to four particular things. And last time I spoke, I really spoke about the general subject of devotion and I tried to lay out for you in that message that the fact that the first church did devote themselves to some things is a very helpful and important lesson for us. Um, whether we see ourselves as a bunch of people who are waiting for an incredible move of God to begin, or whether we see ourselves as living in the after effects of an incredible move of God, or, or whether we just think we want to be in the best position possible for whatever the Holy Spirit does next, I believe the lesson we can learn from Acts chapter 2 is that it's always good to devote ourselves. And for me personally, a key point that I pick up from that is that these first church people, they took an active decision to devote themselves. They weren't simply waiting for things to happen. They weren't simply reacting to events. They made positive decisions and did something about it. And I believe that's important for us. And today I'm going to begin looking at each of the four specific things that they devoted themselves to. And the first area we're going to look at is the Apostles' teaching. Let's remind ourselves first of all of the main passage. I'm going to read it. It's in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. All the believers devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Holy Spirit, as I seek to deliver this message and as a community we listen to it, will you open our, our hearts, open our spiritual eyes and help us to receive truth from you. So the Apostles' teaching... I want to look today at the fact that these church people devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching. What is it, what was it, and what does it mean for us today? The first thing I want to say about this is that it, it was to do with writing the book. Writing the book. Now we, in our modern era, we have our Bibles, we have the Old Testament, and we have the New Testament. These first, first church people, they were Jews who believed that Jesus was their Messiah. They'd accepted the reality of what Jesus had done for them. Their Bible, their scripture, was what we call our Old Testament. The New Testament had not yet been written. They were living in the New Testament. The book had not yet been written down. So a very important part, a key part, of what the Apostles' teaching was, that they were devoting themselves to, was the very first beginnings of the process of our New Testament being written. They were actually in the process of writing the book. And they didn't have the book. So it was obviously all the more important for the people in the first church to be devoting themselves to what the apostles said. Because there was no book to go to. The apostles were this bunch of people who had had the front row seats. They'd had the privilege of being in on all the action in Jesus' ministry while he walked on the earth for three years or so. They saw what he did. They heard his teaching. They probably heard some of his teaching, dare I say it, again and again and again. Yeah, they heard it in one village, and then they probably heard Jesus say some amazing new things in another village. They probably heard some of the same things again and again and again. They saw incredible miracles, signs and wonders performed. And they were the eyewitnesses. They were the best source. If anybody wanted to know about Jesus, they were the people to go to. 
The next thing I want to say about the apostles' teaching is that this teaching that they were devoting themselves to was more than just the giving of information. It was teaching more than information. Sometimes when we think about teaching, we can think that teaching really is about the transfer of information. And information is good. Information is important. But this apostles' teaching was much more than just information. Now, I guess we probably all know that people were amazed at the signs and wonders that they saw Jesus perform. But if you read your Bibles carefully, you'll realise that people were not only amazed at the signs and wonders Jesus performed, we are told more than once in the Gospels that people were amazed at his teaching. And people were amazed that Jesus taught as someone with authority. So they were, Jesus was being compared with the religious leaders of the time who knew the words on the page very well, the words on the scrolls, but Jesus spoke as if he actually knew what he was talking about. His teaching was amazing. And similarly, in the first church, we can see in Acts chapter 2 that around the apostles, there was teaching going on and also signs and wonders were being performed. So I suggest to you that this teaching that the first church people were devoting themselves to was not like just sitting through, dare I say, a boring lecture, or even, dare I say even more, a boring sermon. It was something that you'd really want to be in on. It was exciting. It seemed to have something to it. And this teaching, I also believe, was teaching that had real relevance to people's lives. It wasn't simply going to be an interesting talk about an interesting subject. We can go to hear someone speak and think, oh yeah, that's quite... That's quite interesting. Yeah, I, I probably agree with 100% of that, or maybe 95% of that, or maybe 50% of that, and then walk away and wait for another lecture or maybe another speaker. This teaching, this sort of teaching, is about stuff that makes a difference to the way that you live. It probably sometimes challenges the way that you live, probably challenges the way that you think, but it's not just about theory, it's about real life. Now, I make those observations with some hesitation because if this is what good teaching is like, if this is what Jesus' teaching was like, if this is what the apostles' teaching is like, then here I am delivering a message and I'm, I'm setting the bar for what teaching is supposed to be like. Pretty high. <laughs> it's pretty high. But there we are. And I might feel, whoa, I'm way down here. But I'd much rather set the bar high if it's a good bar and say, well, Brian... You need, to try and, you need to try and measure up to a higher bar. I think it's much better to live that, that way than to uh, compromise for something that's just not as good. So good teaching is supposed to be exciting, combined with manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit, challenging, inspiring, relevant, etc., 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 so that's part of what the first church was devoting themselves to. It wasn't just a transfer of information. They knew, I believe, when they were around the apostles' teaching, that they were coming to something that might sometimes unsettle them, might sometimes fascinate them, but that it had life all over it. It was life-giving and it was relevant to their life. The next main observation I'd like to make about this apostles' teaching is that the job is not done. And this is to do with instruction. What do I mean by the job is not done? Instruction. Well, I'm really moving on now to the issue of what relevance does their devotion to the Apostles' teaching have to me? Because there is one kind of trap we can fall into when we read Acts chapter 2. And the trap, I think, is this. We can say, well, OK, those first Christians... They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They didn't have the New Testament. It's what they needed to do. But I've got the New Testament. I've got, I've got my complete Bible. You know, I'm in a much better position than those first Christians because I've got, I've got all that great stuff written down. Therefore, whatever it was that they were doing when they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that was right and proper for them. But I'm in a completely different situation. Now, I believe that's partly true, but also partly it kind of misses the point. It is brilliant that we have the complete Bible. It is brilliant that we have the New Testament. 
and we should certainly be reading our Bibles. Please don't misunderstand anything that you might hear me say today. I am not in any way trying to say that you shouldn't be reading your Bibles. You should be reading your Bibles. I should be reading my Bible. Brian, you should be reading your Bible. Okay, I'll try to read it some more. It's very important that we know what the Bible says. But I believe there's something, although there's a point of difference between us and the first church, we have the New Testament and they didn't. That is a point of difference. Um, however, my belief is that there's much more that we have in common with them than separates us. And I think the, the key point about the Apostles' teaching and devotion to the Apostles' teaching that we can miss, the key, the key, the key point, is that if, if we devote ourselves to the Apostles' teaching, it means that we are being open to being instructed. It's that we are being open to receive instructions. And I don't want to get in today into the whole question of what is an apostle, how do you recognise an apostle, da, 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 da. I think we can, for today, just take the idea of there being apostles as being a shorthand for anybody that you feel you can respect in the Lord. Anybody that you feel has some kind of measure of wisdom or experience in the things of God that is maybe just a little bit further along the road than you are, so that maybe there's something you could learn from them. That's the kind of relationship I'm talking about. And there is a positive value in the kingdom of God, in the church, to people in church being open to receiving instruction. In fact, there's a positive value to people in church saying, I'm so amazed I've been in a move of the Holy Spirit, or I'm so fed up that I'm not in a move of the Holy Spirit, I want one to arrive, for people like that to say, in view of the fact I'm so amazed I'm in this thing or I'm so wanting it to happen, something I'm going to do as a result of how I feel is I'm going to choose to devote myself to teaching from people who can give me instruction. That might be an easy thing for you to hear or it might be difficult. Um, sometimes we can find that we've been hurt by authority figures. They might be authority figures in church, they might be parents, they might be teachers, they might be other people. We might feel we've been at the receiving end of people who have misused authority. And I sympathise with that. To some degree, I understand it. But don't let the enemy, don't let negative experiences you might have had in your life rob you of the benefits that you can have by being open to receiving instruction from anybody that God puts in your path who can help you make progress along the journey. So instructions can be difficult. Sometimes we don't like receiving instructions. I don't know how you respond to instructions. Um, I haven't got time to go into my whole life experience of dealing with instructions at different levels. Um, if you want to talk to Mary, she might tell you about some times we've had with flat pack furniture or certain electronic devices that have come in the mail. Some of us are temperamentally maybe more interested in reading the instructions before we start assembling the product. Others of us, that's me, are more interested in getting on and trying to make the thing work. I have had my own share of experiences of being halfway through assembling a piece of furniture to find that somehow, mysteriously, one of the key components seems to be the wrong way round or upside down, and sometimes things have to be taken apart again so they can be put together the right way. It's a kind of trivial example, but sometimes, sometimes we don't like being told what to do, or we basically just can't be bothered spending the time and energy learning how to do it before we get on and do it. I guess that can be partly a question of temperament. But probably we all know at some level that there are some times when you just have to be instructed. So for example, if you are a driver, if you're able to drive, um, it's a long time since I passed my test, and back in that day there was no separate theory exam, but I understand now there is a theory exam. But even though we have theory exams nowadays, the theory exam doesn't get you to the point where you can drive safely on your own. I'm pretty sure I'm correct in saying that in this country it's still necessary to have lessons. Um, maybe not, even if not formal lessons before your test, I would... Im I, 
I think it must be true that anybody who's learned to drive has had, at some degree, another human being sitting in a vehicle with them, probably for at least a few hours, actually helping them learn how to drive. You know, I would be horrified at the idea of someone being unleashed on the roads of England with a vehicle without ever having had another human being in the car. For them to say, well, I've, I've read in the book how to drive. You know, how complicated can it be? Um, so that's a simple example. I'll give you a couple of other examples from my personal experience. These kind of slightly expose me, but I feel quite relaxed about that. Um, some years ago, I decided I was going to learn how to play golf. Um, with some people I worked with, it was quite useful to be able to play golf. There would be golf tournaments that I'd be invited to, etc., etc. And I liked the game anyway. And I, I was trying to learn how to play golf, and um, it wasn't going very well. And I decided to do some research, so I got one or two books. And I read those books quite carefully. And I can't go into all the technicalities, but the, the, a key area for me was the swing, how you actually swing the golf club. And there's a lot to do with the position of the body and what you're supposed to do. And I read those books really carefully. And I, as far as I know, I followed the instructions very carefully as well. But remarkably, it did nothing to improve my game. Um, I was often still either not hitting the ball very well or missing the ball completely, which is really embarrassing. It's particularly embarrassing when you do that in front of other people on a golf course. And I eventually decided that um, I needed some help. So I had golf lessons with a human being, with a professional who knew what they were talking about. And I can still remember the shock, really in my first lesson, I'd read all of these books about the position my body was supposed to be in, and this professional put my body in the position it was supposed to be in. And I remember thinking, there's no way this is what it said in the book. You know, I, I studied what the book said about how I was supposed to be, but it took a human being who knew, who knew how to hit a golf ball, who knew what position your body was supposed to be in before the golf ball was hit, I needed that human being actually to be with me and to put me in the position. And I kind of learned a lesson with that. My well, sire kind of learned a lesson, but it turns out I didn't learn that much of a lesson. Because a bit later, I was learning to play the saxophone. I just had this idea, I think I'd like to learn the saxophone. Bought a second-hand saxophone and had some books. And I was reading up in the books. And... Um, it wasn't, going, it wasn't going very well. And again, I'm kind of ashamed to admit this, but it even got to the point where, because it, because it was a second-hand saxophone, I actually got to the point where I convinced myself that the problem was the saxophone. That there must be something wrong with the saxophone, because there were notes I was supposed to be able to get out of this instrument, and what was coming out, they weren't really notes. They were not just like squawks and farps. So I eventually decided I maybe needed a lesson. So I went to see this guy who knew how to play the saxophone. And one of the first things he did, it was quite offensive, he, got, he took my saxophone and he made notes come out of that saxophone that I had convinced myself could not be produced by that instrument. It turns out the problem was with me. And um, so I had to be with someone who knew how to do the thing that I didn't know how to do. And he then had to take me through a process of talking to me and showing me things to do with simple stuff like, Brian, you need to practice more. And um, there are certain things about the muscles in your mouth and the way you actually make sound come out using the reed that you've just got to, get, you've got to practice and get stronger. And there are some of the things, Brian, that you're doing that are just bad. Stop it. So those were lessons from life. Sometimes... In fact, very often with important things in life, reading something on a book, or dare I say it, watching somebody on the internet, just doesn't do it. You need a person, you need a relationship. So sometimes we need someone to help us. And um, speaking personally, I've had the privilege over a whole number of years of having a number of people who I know believe in me, who I know love me, 
who I know want the best for me. But those people, I have given them the right to, as I would say, speak into my life. I've given them the right to challenge me. I've given them the right to say, Brian, some of the things that you do and some of the things that you say just don't really square up with the standard that Jesus sets. In fact, they don't really square up with who we believe you are supposed to be as Brian. You know, these things don't suit you. And if I told you that those conversations are always easy and never are a problem, that would be a lie. But equally, having those relationships hasn't felt like I'm being controlled by anybody else or that I'm being manipulated or controlled by anybody else. Those relationships have been with people who I love them and I know that they love me. You might struggle to think that you have those people in your life at the moment. And if you are listening to this thinking, I need that kind of relationship, I wish I could make it super easy for you and say, all you need to do is steps one, two, and three, and suddenly those relationships will be there for you. But the reality is it might take a little bit more work. But I strongly, strongly, strongly urge you to think and pray carefully about whether you, at the moment, have the pieces in place, really, the right people in place who can actually give you the bit of help that you need to do life better. My desire for this church family, really as my desire would be for any community of faith, is that we don't give up on the commitment to continuous improvement, that we don't give up on a relentless commitment to always growing to be more and more like Jesus. You know, I'm getting older, and um, Crumbs, Mary and I, we've been married for, I can't really believe how long we've been married. You know, we've been married longer than we've been, than we've been alive before we knew each other before that. It's a long, long time. And um, I'd like to say that it's automatic that the older you get, the wiser you get, but it isn't true. We're not, going to, we're not going to grow in God spiritually automatically just by getting older. You know, 2020 has been quite a year, hasn't it? Probably many of us have learned a few interesting things in 2020. But getting through another year like 2020 or getting through 2019 or 2018 or 2021, getting through another year doesn't make you more mature in God. It requires something more of you. God is on your case all the time. God is always wanting to work on your character, on your spiritual development. But we can resist God, either knowingly or maybe not quite so knowingly. We can resist him. But I strongly urge you to take positive steps to find the people who can help you on the way. There'll be people in Gateway who can. There'll be other people who can. There's the uh, uh, great resource that we have of life groups you know, if you're not already actively in a life group, I'd encourage you to, to be in a life group. Find people who you can learn from, who you can trust. Like my golf teacher, like my saxophone teacher, people can, who can help you do better at life. I'm going to suggest uh, three practical steps you could take, just in closing. So three, three practical steps to take. The first is read the Bible for yourself. And I don't just mean, well, if you've read the Bible once, if you've like read through the Bible in a year, that's a great box to tick. Great, I read the Bible in a year. But don't stop reading the Bible just because you've read it in a year. You know, you've read it in a year. That's great. Well done. But read it again. Keep reading it. Um, it's very important that we are familiar with the Word of God. And not just that we kind of remember what it says because we've read it once, but that we keep putting ourselves in front of the Word of God so that we can allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to read us. That's very important. It's a bit easy for any of us to rely on the fact that someone else is reading the Word of God. It's a bit easy to let the leader of your life group or your pastors or some preacher person on the internet to have read the Word of God and to give you something that is easy to consume. I'm not saying those things are bad in themselves, but if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be reading the Word of God. It's really, really important. That's step one. 
Step two is learn and explore in a group. Now, that, those groups could, of course, include life groups. There could be other groups. Uh, a group might just be a pair. But it's very important that as we go, carry on life's journey of growing to be more and more like Jesus, it's very important that we don't let ourselves fall into the trap of thinking that all I need is me and God. Me and Jesus, that's all that's necessary. Um, because we all have blind spots. We all have areas of our understanding and expertise and know-how where we've got a particular view on something and it might not actually really agree with what Jesus wants for us. And we can be very genuinely doing the best we can in our daily walk. But there are some things we're doing that are based upon something we believe or think that has nothing to do with God. It's more to do with our culture, our national history, or quite often something in our family. You know, we, we all come from a particular family, and I, I've come from a family, just like you have, and um, I can tell you that from my limited experience, most families are a little bit strange in some ways. You know, love, full of lovely people, hopefully, but every family has its, has its funny ways. And in our family histories, we can pick up things, ways of behaving, things that we believe, that we assume are just true. And they might not be true. So none of us has a monopoly on the truth. None of us has the complete picture. And it's healthy to be in a learning community. It's healthy to be in a group where other people have the chance to say, well, how about this? Or have you thought about that? So practical step number two, learn in a group. Don't be isolated. Don't just use the internet. The internet's a great resource. There's also a lot of rubbish on the internet. I'm not trying to say don't use the internet, but don't just rely on the Holy Spirit and the internet. You know, try to connect with real people. And the last step, this is going on from being in a group. Try to find, try to identify at least one person who can speak into your life. And, and sometimes for some people this might be quite a big step because it might, it might touch on a kind of sore area in your heart where you've maybe been hurt or where you maybe feel you've been betrayed in the past. And even though those hurts and fears can be real, you need, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to get over that stuff, to get healed of that stuff, to be able to move beyond that stuff and say, OK, Holy Spirit, although I've been hurt... I'm going to trust again. I'm going to try again. Because this, I'm going to accept that this is an important part of how you've made me that I need to learn from somebody else. So with the Holy Spirit's help, I pray that you will be able to find a way to have at least, at least one other person who has the right to speak into your life. The, a problem I think we have culturally is it's very easy to have people that we like and respect and who are our friends but we can often just be a little bit shy of getting to the point of saying, can we just make this friendship a bit more than a friendship? Can I just recognise that you have got something that I really need? That's a step that maybe is a bit more difficult for us to take. I strongly recommend that you take that step. In closing, I want to... Um, speak particularly to anybody who's watching this who hasn't yet become a Christian or maybe you've, you're not sure whether you're a Christian. I just want to spend a couple of minutes to say, first of all, thank you for lasting this long. Well done. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I just want to address the question of what is there in this message for you? What relevance does this have for you? I've been talking about devotion to the apostles teaching i've been talking about being formed to be more like jesus I've, I've been talking about the the quality and standard the very high bar that was set by jesus's teaching that amazed people and jesus was a great teacher and i don't know whether you would say this but many people who don't identify as christians would still say they recognize jesus as a great teacher And that's true, Jesus is a great teacher. But if Jesus' claims about himself being God's son are not true, 
then Jesus is not a great teacher. The great Christian philosopher C.S. Lewis made the observation that if what Jesus said about himself is not true, then Jesus is not a good teacher. He's either mad or he's very bad. So if you're, if you're inclined to think of, of Jesus as a great teacher, but you're not committed to him, you're not really recognising who he is and what he did for you, you're not really accepting what he taught as a great teacher. You need to look at the whole package. And his teachings are very good, but that whole package of what he taught includes the fact that he taught very clearly that there's a problem that we have in our trying to have a relationship with God, and that's caused by something called sin. And Jesus came to address that problem. He died a death on the cross and was resurrected so that that problem that separates each one of us from God can be dealt with. Christianity isn't a religion in a sense of it being about a set of rules to obey. It's about the relationship. We can have that relationship with God because of who Jesus is, the Son of God, and what he did. He died for each one of us. He died for you. So there's an invitation. If you haven't already accepted it, or you're not sure whether you've accepted it, there's an invitation for you to have that relationship with God. And I'm going to read a short prayer, and it will come up on the screen as well. And if you're saying that for the first time, or maybe in a way that you know you mean it today, maybe more than you've ever meant it before, then just agree with it. Say I agree or amen or just know that you're agreeing with it. Here's the prayer. Jesus, I believe you are God's son and that you died on the cross for me and that you came back from the dead. I choose to follow you. Amen. So, thank you for listening. If you have just said that prayer in a new way or maybe for the first time, well done. Uh, welcome to God's family. I'd encourage you to find a local church. Um, if you're anywhere near Gateway Freedom Church, we'd be delighted to have contact with you. There are ways to connect with us through our website. But wherever you are, find a church, find some Christians, and let them know that you've said that prayer and you can carry on your amazing journey of getting to know Jesus better. Thank you for listening. God bless you.